Software development is a discipline of dealing with abstractions. We capture ideas and crystallize them into a form that a computer can execute. We encode our ideas in plain text, but actually it's just a series of bytes like everything else. We organize our work into files that don't really exist, stored in folders that don't really exist, and we store some of them in clusters of transistors built from electrons that don't really exist, and the absence of electrons that certainly don't exist. All of this is kind of crazy, but it works. Ours is a profession of abstraction built on top of many, many layers of abstraction. However, all abstractions break down. At some point, our abstractions tend to leak through. If you want to build a complex system, then some of these abstractions matter more than others. That is why we came up with the idea of mechanical sympathy. What should we think about when building software systems? When do the abstractions in our hardware leak through to an effect the way in which we should think about the solutions that we create in software? Hi, I'm Dave Farley of Continuous Delivery. Welcome to my channel. Thank you very much for joining me here. And if you haven't already, please do hit subscribe. And if you enjoy the content, please hit like too. Um, I have a new training course out this week called Getting Going with Continuous Delivery Pipelines. This is a practical guide to starting and improving your deployment pipelines and including, includes a real-world case study of the LMAX pipeline. It costs just £99 or about $135. So check out the links in the description uh, for the details of this and my other courses below. In this episode, I want to explore the idea of mechanical sympathy. This phrase was invented by Formula One race driver Jackie Stewart, who said, you don't have to be an engineer to be a race driver, but you do have to have mechanical sympathy. What he meant by this was that you needed to understand enough about how a car worked to take advantage of its capabilities and to understand its limitations. I worked in a team building an extremely high performance system. The CTO was my friend Martin Thompson, who as well as being a world class expert on high performance computing, is also a Formula One fan. So as we started to think carefully about how to maximise the performance of our designs, think carefully about how the hardware worked, Martin recognised this and told us the story about Jackie Stewart and his idea of mechanical sympathy. So what does this mean and how do we apply it to designing software systems? First, this is not only about high performance, though that is probably its most direct expression. All abstractions are imperfect and ultimately in some form or another break down and so leak information about what is really going on beneath them. The idea of mechanical sympathy is that we need to understand enough about how the underlying stuff really works so that we can recognise the layers of abstraction that we depend upon and where they're likely to break down and affect us. For that, we need a good practical working model of the underlying systems that, that we work upon. Let's start with a reasonably simple example. Imagine we have a conventional old school spinning rust hard disk. Then it's a random access de device, isn't it? Well, up to a point. The abstraction that persistent stores have tried to offer us for a long, have long been built around this idea. You can ignore the workings of the disk and get data consistently from anywhere on that disk. And that's true. But the problem is that this is true only as long as you ignore time. When time matters, this abstraction leaks. Yes, you can get data from anywhere on the disk with the same instructions, but how long that takes varies significantly. The time it takes depends on where the information is actually stored on the disk. If for some reason you need to improve the performance of your data retrieval, you must take this time difference into account and understand how a disk drive works to do so. 
This are divided into a series of platters organised into sectors and tracks. Each track on a platter within a sector stores a little packet of data. You retrieve data from the disk in these packets, blocks. A disk is a block storage device. That is the first really useful thing to understand about any form of disk storage. If you want write code that retrieves single bytes from multiple blocks, your code is going to be massively inefficient. This platter track sector model provides a kind of coordinate system to locate data on the disk. Depending on where the read write head is at the point when I ask for data, has a big difference on how long it will take to get the block that I'm interested in. We think of disks as random access devices. Actually, they're optimised to be serial streaming devices. If you treat them like that, you can shift a lot more data. Sometimes that kind of thing matters. Yeah, but you're well out of date, old man, I hear you say. We use SSDs these days. Fair enough, but I've got some news for you. SSDs aren't random access in time either. The big difference in performance for SSDs is the difference between reads, writes and deletions. Writing is much, much slower, 10 to 15 times slower than reading on an SSD. Deleting things is even slower than that. This means that there's a dramatic difference in the performance of an SSD depending on what you're doing. When reading or writing data to a previously unused block compared to overwriting a used, previously used block, there's a huge difference, for example. So if you ignore the details, this could make a big difference in the performance of your system. SSDs also incorporate garbage collection to ease the erasure costs and multi-layer caching, all of which means that there are differences in performances again, depending on the circumstances and the, the parameters with which you use the disk. Depending on whether you get a cache hit or a cache missed is going to have a big impact on the performance and throughput of the data transfer. All of these things should impact on the design of your code if performance matters. As I said though, this isn't all about performance. Although mechanical th sympathy is an idea that has mostly taken off in high performance computing, it's also true of other things. One that we don't often think about is in communications. I think that mostly as programmers, when we think of one process or computer communicating with another, we tend to think in terms of synchronous communications. Probably some kind of request-response approach is the, the commonest model for that these days. But this is an illusion, another abstraction. It leaks in terms of time, like the disk example, but it also leaks pretty badly in the face of failure. Ask anyone who's done any distributed computing at any scale, and they will tell you that it's orders of magnitude more complex than computing based on local calls. This is because of all the stuff that can go wrong. Our code may fail to connect to the remote end. Our message may get lost in transmission. There may be a bug on the receiving end. Uh, the connection may break trying to send the response. The response may be lost. There may be a bug in our handling of the response. All of these failures could leave your code in a different state with respect to the remote end of the conversation, adding to an explosive growth in the complexity of error handling as a result. For distributed systems, this is where the complexity lies, this, this hiding of these failure modes. This is a leak in the abstraction that communications are synchronous. They're not. In reality, networks are based on the asynchronous transmission of packets. Network protocols like TCP IP lay us some promises about the ordering of packets and attempt to retry deliveries if there's a problem on top of the much simpler unordered packet delivery system of IP. But the illusion of synchronous comp communications is built even higher up the stack than that. We need something to understand where to send the responses to when we're replying to the message, and processes that block threads so that they will wait for, for a response to, to, to arrive. 
It's impossible to hide all of this complexity in the face of failure, and so it leaks out when things start to go wrong. I am almost certainly in a minority here when I say that I think that distributed systems are simpler when you treat them as asynchronous systems and stop trying to hide the distribution and natural asynchrony of the communications mechanism. But that's probably just my, my take on this. Mechanical sympathy isn't about being a hardware expert, or about thinking about every last detail that is happening beneath the abstractions that we use. Rather, it's about knowing enough about when you need to look deeper into the problem. One way to use it is to have a few rules of thumb, general ideas about, uh, a general appreciation about what is possible and what is not based on the hardware that we're hardware that we rely on. When I was writing high performance systems, I, I, I can remember the numbers of how, how long it would take to get a packet off a network across the boundary of a network card and into the, the operating system stack. Just understanding some of these sorts of ideas can be useful tools. Here are a few simple examples of guidelines that may help out. One of the difficulties with understanding modern computer hardware is that it is so fast that we've kind of lost track of how amazing it is. And that gives us a big problem because the numbers that we deal with are so out of our normal experience that it's hard to really comprehend the difference between different kinds of things. So here's my quick stab at trying to give you that. Let's imagine for a moment that instead of a clock cycle in a modern PC taking about three billionths of a second, instead it takes one second, a more human time scale. What would that mean for um, some common operations if that was true? Well, if one CPU cycle took one second, then the first thing to think about is probably a level one cache hit. Modern CPUs have multiple layers of cache to, to try and smooth the throughput of the incredibly slow RAM compared to the incredibly fast processing on the CPU itself. So a level one cache hit takes about 0.9 nanoseconds. In our, new mo in our new time scale, that would be three seconds. Level two cache hit, about nine seconds. Level three cache hit, 43 seconds. At this point, if we need, if we can't, if we have a cache miss at that point, our processor is going to go out and access main memory. That's going to take considerably longer. That's going to take 120 nanoseconds, which turns out to be the equivalent of about six minutes. A computer to computer communication over 10 meters of fiber would take 20.05 microseconds, or in our new time scale, 18 hours. Solid state disk I.O., four days. Running spinning rust disk I.O., six months. Internet conversation between Europe and Australia or between USA and China, it would take about 180 milliseconds. That is 19 years. A computer reboot, about five minutes, that was the equivalent of 31,000 years. The timescales in modern hardware are, at some level, ridiculous. The, the um, hardware is so efficient that it's sometimes hard to get our heads around. Thinking in these, some, these kinds of terms can sometimes help. I think that it's worth thinking about these sorts of things from time to time. Software is almost certainly the most inefficient thing in human experience. We accept levels of inefficiency in software that are unimaginable in other spheres. It's common for software to be thousands of times slower than it needs to be, tens of thousands of times bigger than it needs to be. If we don't pay attention, the size of the runtime libraries, the vendor bundle, for even a simple Angular application can be measured in multiple megabytes. Though it's got a bit better in recent versions. Let's just remember that a megabyte is over a million bytes. If you assume no compression, one byte per character, you can record all of the works of Shakespeare in about five megabytes. My bet is that the average app, Angular app doesn't contain as much real information as the works of Shakespeare in general. That's quite a lot of stuff. 
So thinking about software in these terms is sometimes helpful and sometimes makes us one, appreciate the staggering improvements that our hardware uh, uh, colleagues have made and two thinks about how we can use those improvements more efficiently. Thank you very much for watching.